the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Math and Physics podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray, and we welcome you to episode number 64, where today, as you can see, we have a special guest. We have Dr. Don Lincoln here with us today from Fermilab. So for, for our listeners out there, you've probably heard of the YouTube channel Fermilab, or at least have seen a couple videos here and there, and you might notice Mr. Dr. Don Lincoln right here. So we have, <laughs> we have him on this podcast. I am so excited. You might be able to see it. Very, very excited you're on here today. So before we actually get into it, Don, maybe you just want to introduce yourself to our listeners, you know, who you are, what you do, just a brief, and then we can get into it later again. So Don. Sure. So my name is Don Lincoln. I'm a physicist at Fermilab, which is America's flagship particle physics laboratory. I've been doing particle physics for, I don't know, several decades now. I split my research time between working at Fermilab, which is just outside of Chicago, and the Large Hadron Collider, which is in Europe. Um, so that's my research that I do. I'm interested in looking at the most fundamental building blocks of the universe, the laws that, that essentially make the universe, the cosmos, possible. Um, and then as a side gig, something that I'm very passionate about is science communication. So I make YouTube videos, I write for things like Scientific American, I write for CNN, I make books, uh, um, work, uh, do things for the great courses. So I do a lot of science um, communication. And that's, I think it's really important for frontline scientists to share what they know True. so that the world can, can appreciate just how cool it is. Yeah, for, for sure. sure for sure. Like one thing that a lot of people um, are kind of dismissive about is how cool science is because they think of a scientist and they're like, you know, whatever, it's too complicated. But the thing is, because you don't give them a chance to communicate, like you don't give them a chance to explain what it is they're doing, because a lot of the times the really complicated things could be explained in a simple theoretical way, like in a simple concept. Like, you don't need insane levels of math sometimes to explain the building blocks of nature. And especially with your YouTube channel is a perfect example. You take crazy complicated topics and you explain it to, you know, laymen, basically. Right. So, like, you know, that's, that, that is the essence of science. And that's what we need from people, you know, like you to share that knowledge with us. So that's perfect. Perfect way to put yeah. it, yeah. I mean, the fact is science, I mean, doing science yeah. is hard. For uh, sure. But 100%. learning about but learning about science, the big pictures, the big idea, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's something that I think most people can, can understand and embrace. You know? mm -hmm. Definitely. And the more people are actually, you know, on the front line and communicating what they're doing, the more people you can reach globally to embark on this journey of science and okay. to just keep on discovering more and more. So yeah. science is the act. And I, we say this so many times. <laughs> science is the act of asking why and everyone asks the question why like in some point in their life you will ask that question like <laughs> so many people say when we're talking about some complicated things that oh you know i just don't care like when you ask oh you know why does this happen oh i don't care why is the sky blue oh i don't care whatever it's blue but the thing is there is definitely a part of them that doesn't know and that part is saying i don't care but there is an inquisitive part which is what scientists are trying to reach to try and communicate that level you know, to get that understanding, because that understanding, just that basic understanding was what you're saying, you know, is very fundamental. And everyone can access that. Everyone can access that basic knowledge. Right. I also think it's really important because in addition to, you know, just understanding and the things that, that drive me, yeah. there's a society side of things, because there are many issues in, in the world things like uh, climate change or vaccines or things like that, which are scientifically driven. And science knows, knows stuff. I mean, we actually know what we're talking about much of the time. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, then we figure it out. And so you may, like, for instance, with the vaccine stuff, uh, for COVID especially, you know, there were some things in the beginning where people thought that the scientists thought that this was the right thing. But then when they learned more, they changed the direction because because that's how science works. As you learn, you get closer and closer to the truth. And so I think it's really important for scientists to talk to society because there are so many problems out there that we can fix. Um, but to fix them first, you have to understand them. And, you know, that's where the scientists come in. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. The solutions are tough. The solutions require everybody. It's not just scientists. We shouldn't just do what scientists say. You should listen to, um, you know, politician. You listen to clergy. You should listen to business. You should listen to everybody. But you should at least agree on the facts. Yeah, exactly. And that's what facts. we do. That's a, you know, that's that's the thing today. Like especially in today's world, like everyone's disputing all these things, like anti-vaxxers and all this stuff. Like, okay, have your own opinion, but you can't say you you can't like dispute some of the hard evidence facts that we have to do with exactly these things, you know like anyways i mean there are a lot of people in the world unfortunately and a lot of them have their own views so <laughs> there's that <laughs> yeah let's so get before into the we, segment yeah yeah exactly. be- before we continue here on the podcast yeah we'd like to remind you guys every single week that we are now up to 133,000 downloads thank oh. you everybody who's been downloading listening to the podcast every single week um also one thing that we meant to mention last week is that we're going to start posting these episodes at um 12 True. instead of 10 a.m um eastern. this one's gonna eastern. yeah eastern. eastern time um it's gonna like we've been posting at 10 a.m every single time this one's also gonna go up at 10 a.m but the next one's gonna go up at 12 just a we'll slight change there yeah, um just, also just i don't think we're dealing it yeah yeah, also, we're up to 9,200 followers on Spotify. Thank you to everybody that's been listening on Spotify. And if you're listening right now, make sure to follow us wherever mm-hmm. you're listening on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple. And uh, yeah, thank There's you so that. much. Also, one thing we never mentioned, though, on Spotify is our listeners. Like, isn't that also an important... Like, I don't know. I just think we're, we're very close to the 30,000 listener milestone. So I just think that that's something that we should maybe mention. You know, so 30,000 of you guys are listening to our podcast. So that's really nice. So thank you for that. And now going and moving on to the comment of the week. We have Mariana's comment here from Brazil. We have her saying, this is one of the best podcasts I've listened to. Two young students talking about such interesting topics in an easy way. It feels like I'm also talking to you. Congrats. Love from Brazil. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you so much. And, and if you want to be the comment of the week, yeah. next week's episode, make sure to leave a comment in the comment section of the YouTube video. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's let's get into the podcast with the classic question. So the very first question that we have on this podcast for almost any guest, how did you get into your field? Like what inspired you to start physics? <laughs> So I've always been interested in what one might call existential questions, things that were once theological and then philosophical. And that's still true. In fact, I have uh, minor degrees in both theology and philosophy because those fascinate me. But um, as I I studied those things and and science, it became clear to me that to, to answer questions like, how did the universe come into existence? What is the ultimate fate of the universe? Why does the universe have to be the way it is? Does it have to be the way it is? What are the ultimate building blocks and the forces that hold it together? It was very clear to me that one could sit and sort of philosophize about these things. You could actually dig into the scientific method and learn about it. So when I went into college, there was no question I was going to do physics. There was some question whether it was going to be particle physics or cosmology. But back in the 1980s, there was uh, just a, a lot fewer experimental options for cosmology, whereas particle physics was, was going strong. And um, so, so that's what I did. I, I went to college, um, a, a small university that most people have never heard of, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. It's, a, it's an engineering school. I then went on to get my master's and doctorate at Rice University in Houston, Texas, which is a, a pretty good school. Um, then I moved onward to the University of Michigan for my postdoctoral work. Um, and then finally at a Fermilab, again, America's flagship uh, particle physics laboratory. My thesis work was on a small experiment, which I enjoyed immensely. And I enjoyed it because there were so few people on it, which meant that we had to do everything. Mm-hmm. There were only, there were maybe 30 names, but maybe 10 people that, that did all the work and three or four that really did all the work. And so you had to be the person who built the detector, did the, um, wrote the data software, wrote the uh, um, the simulations, um, the were data you part unpacking, of the three or and four? so forth. Were you part Excuse of the me? three or four people? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, you yeah. were. Of course you were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, sure. No, there was there was there were two students who did just about everything. Me and a <laughs> a, profe- a person who's Donna Naples. Um, she's a professor now at University right. of Pittsburgh, and um, then there were of course our advisors. But our advisors 
had to go back and teach. Mm -hmm. And so Donna and I, we, we worked day and night. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, people can't appreciate how crazy it was unless you really love science. For instance, um, I would work from eight in the morning till midnight, six days a week. And then I would, on Sundays, I would work from eight until about, I don't know, six o'clock. And then I would go home and, and do, uh, you know, uh, grocery shopping and Wait, do my eight in the morning stuff. till midnight? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is not an exaggeration. Be, but what, that's what I wanted to do. You know, wow, I loved what I was doing. Right yeah. I mean, we were building a detector to answer this crazy question. What we did is we had what is still the highest energy beam of photons ever made. Now, there are, it's possible to make higher energy photons using different techniques, but we made a beam of, of incredibly high energy photons. And what we were doing was we were using those to hit hyd the nuclei of hydrogen, so protons. And we were trying to, to study the transition from nuclear physics to particle physics. So where the forces that held together the proton dominated to the point where you hit them hard enough that you could actually knock the quarks outside of protons. So that's what we did. And uh, that was a fascinating thing. We were also looking at what, what sounds crazy, but we were looking at what's called the structure of photons. So photons are supposedly point-like particles, and it is, in a certain degree they are. However, quantum mechanics is true. And so a photon moving along will spontaneously transform itself into other particles and then transform back into a photon. So the right way to think of a photon is it's... Um, it's moving along, and then it might split into, a, for instance, an electron and an antimatter electron, and then back to a photon, and then it can transform into a, a quark and an antimatter quark, and back into a photon, and over and over again. And so what we were trying to study is what the structure of the photon was during those moments when it had transformed itself into quarks. And so it was really kind of neat, and you do that by smashing photons into other things. And so anyways, we you know, had to make the beamline work. We had to build the detector, which was you know, the size of a very large room. By modern particle physics experiments, it was relatively small, but it was, it was interesting. Um, I built my own what's called a calorimeter, an energy, ring, energy measuring device. Um, so we stacked plates of steel and welded it and put the detectors in, and that was fascinating. Anyways, so that's what I did. Um, and then later, I moved on to a very different experiment, an experiment that was huge at the time. At the time, it was one of the largest experiments out there. It had 500 collaborators rather than the three or four. <laughs> and of those 500, many of them were involved, at least half of them. And so it's a very different uh, thing because you don't do everything for one thing. And the other aspect of that is the experiment was huge. It was, uh, it was about 10 meters tall and about 15 meters long. And it had um, perhaps a million individual detector elements inside it. And so when you have an experiment of that magnitude, no one individual can, can do everything. So mm -hmm. one person will do the data taking because we had to record data at ridiculous rates. Um, another person would unpack the data. Another, in each detector, uh, several people would be working on building and understanding. Other people would be analyzing the data. So it's a different mentality. We went from this small... Um, workshop kind of experiment to essentially a more corporate mentality. And uh, it, was, it was quite a change, but that was the experiment that discovered the top quark, and so that was pretty fascinating. We did that in the March of 1995 is when we made that announcement. Um, after I worked on that for many years, the, the accelerator at Fermilab, which had been the largest and highest energy collider in the world for perhaps two decades, was finally surpassed by the Large Hadron Collider in 2011 in Europe. And so many of us, I mean, this was clear this was coming, so many of us uh, slowly transitioned from working on the Fermilab Tevatron to the Large Hadron Collider. And now the experiments are even larger. There's 3,000 people on my experiment, wow. which, is, which is pretty crazy. And it's in Europe, and I am in Chicago much of the time. So we fly back and forth. Um, a lot of the computing is distributed. The data analysis is totally distributed. We build detectors here, ship them there, and then people will install them, usually our younger st our, our postdocs. So um, people who have their PhD, but they're you know, maybe two years past the PhD, they will then move to Europe, spend a couple of years there installing and shaking down the equipment. Um, wow. And so, so that was my path. I've, I've you know, started out in a, a small rural town. So this is perhaps important for uh, listeners 
who maybe don't come from a strong science background. I certainly didn't. I came from what one might call an academically impoverished household. My dad never finished, co uh, never finished high school, I should say. So um, it's quite possible for a person who is passionate about science to, you know, you need to do your homework. You need to understand what universities to go to. But it is very possible for someone who, is, who, who thinks this is important to make that transition and eventually you could be like me, working at the biggest particle physics laboratory in the U.S. So mm -hmm. living with like, you know, someone like, as you said, like your father who hadn't been to high school, how did that transition to this insane passion for physics? Because you, st you, you started this thing by saying there was, there's no question I was going into physics. Like, where was well, that I, from? Where did, the, where did that start? I, really well, when I, I, I was a, a crazy reader when I was a kid, okay. you know, so like I, I, I read ridiculously, like a book a day kind of thing. And most of it was science fiction, but not all of it. Some of it was things like Isaac Asimov and Carl Sagan and Jar, uh, George Gamow. So science popularizers. And in fact, that's part of the reason why I write books now is because people who did that for me back in, say, the 1970s, well, you know, there's some kid in, in you know, Saskatchewan or uh, Iowa or California or I don't know where, and who's in the same boat as I am. And so it's a different world. Books are not the best way, perhaps, to communicate these days. Now it's online, podcasts, YouTube videos, and so forth. And so I've selected these methodologies to hopefully connect to some people. And I know it's been true because I've had people you know, come up to me and, you know, I've been sitting in my office, someone walks in with a book that I wrote some years ago and asked me to sign it and says, you know, I got my PhD because I read this book wow. you know, 10 years ago. So I know it happens. That must be a feeling. Wow. It's pretty cool. And now, nowadays it's easier than ever because of the internet. You can literally get a quality education for free <laughs> on the internet. So literally anybody can do it from their, I mean, their phone is maybe an exaggeration, but you know, if you have a computer, you can definitely do it. Yeah, we live in a world of opportunity right now. Like, to be honest, a lot of people, I guess even us, like you're talking about, like, I still can't even imagine 8 a.m. to midnight. I don't even know what that's like. <laughs> like, how does that even work? Because I'm just thinking we live in a world today where everything is either, you know, I don't know. I think hard work is gone, is gone down the drain because we see all these things today with all of these opportunities like as i was saying and you see you see that you know the people actually putting in work is what's not really recognized as you said you know like what you just did like no no one recognized you for that out of the 30 40 people there were two people that were actually doing it right so like the recognition aspect i think has sincerely dropped but not that that should really deter anyone because again we're not really doing this so the world can like we're doing this to advance what we believe is true to advance science right well in all fairness in in that small experiment yeah. it was well known who were the people who were putting in the time because there were okay. some people that would do the nine to fivers yeah. only during the week but you know they weren't the person that then wrote the entire data acquisition software or the person who wrote the, the opposite, where we took the bits and bytes and, and the data just, you know, was a series of bits is all. And you had to then pull it off the tapes and then turn it into something that you could run in a computer program. People know, I mean, uh, it was a small experiment. People knew who the workers were. So, um, you know, I, 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 I certainly got credit. Okay. It's harder, I think, in the big experiments yeah. where someone works really hard, but they do a fantastic job on a small piece. But, it, you know, and the problem is if you're not working on that small piece, you might not recognize that that person was a hero. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I do find it harder in the big experiments now for someone to to become noticed by a, a broad spectrum of the experiment. And that, that does I make it hard. I can see that. I can definitely see that because I think they're definitely, yeah, with the big experiments with like, you know, thousands of people, I can obviously now start to understand how there can be people completely unnoticed, you know? And talking about these big experiments, I think now we have to ask, because this was a long time coming, the muon G-2 experiment. So that happened at Fermilab and for, for our listeners out there. So I guess, so we've actually not spoken about this. And we, now, now this is funny. We, we actually waited. <laughs> No, okay, but very, very briefly though, on the on the on the Q and A episode, very, very briefly, mm -hmm. 
but I'm saying we had a particle physicist on here like two, three episodes ago, and we were going to ask him, but then we had you coming on. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just not talk about muon G minus two at all because it's a Fermilab discussion. So so let's get into it. What What is, just explain to our all, all our viewers here, because again, we've never really gotten into it before. Like, what is the muon G minus two experiment? Why is it so phenomenal? And what does it mean for science? All right, so let's back up because okay, to understand yeah. this, we need we need a lot of background. Let's get the background. So let's so um, let's start not with muons but with electrons. So we know from experiments, the stern gerlach experiment, for instance, from a hundred years ago, that electrons have spin, and they have spin of plus or minus a half. So this we know to be true. Now, spin, of course, doesn't mean spin in the same way that you think of spinning a ball, but nonetheless, it has angular momentum. So any object that has spin and an electric charge, which the electron does, is also a magnet. And so what we are talking about to start with is essentially how strong of a magnet these subatomic particles are. Now, the G in G minus 2 is called the gyromagnetic ratio. And so essentially what it is, it is a ratio of the the amount of the magnetic strength of a particle divided by what's called the Bohr magneton, which is a thing that Bohr came up with. And in 1935, in classical quantum mechanics, people did a bunch of work, and maybe 1938, a little bit older, later than that, people calculated, and G should equal exactly 2. Exactly. Numerically, oh. period, 2. 2.0 infinity. Oh, Nothing. Nice. So that was great. But in 1948, an experiment measured the, the G for an electron, and they found that it wasn't 2, it was 2.00238. So it was 0.1% difference. So now it would be easy to imagine that if you did an experimental measurement and you got something that was 0.1% off from the prediction, that you just made a, some sort of experimental error, and the reality right. is it really was 2, and the 0.001% it was uh, not 0.01 percent, but yeah. the 0.1 percent was simply you just goofed up. However, the uncertainties on the measurement were much smaller than that 0.1 percent. So, if you believe the uncertainties, it was simply true that the magnetic moment of the electron was not two; it was 0.1 percent difference. So, it didn't take very long for theorists to think about that and say, "Aha, you're right. It is in fact 0.1 percent." And the people that did that, well, first it was Julian Schwinger, but what the, the people that, that did all the work eventually shared the Nobel Prize, uh, Schwinger, Tomonaga, and Feynman, for the um, investigation and discovery of quantum electrodynamics, or QED. So what we now know is surrounding a bare electron, there is a cloud of vir what we call virtual particles, particles that appear and disappear all the time. So you've heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Things can happen as long as, and not even conserve energy, as long as the non-conservation of energy is short enough. And so what happens if you look at an electron, you will see that it gives off photons that then make electron and antimatter electrons that then recombine into photons and go back into the electron. But you should think of the electron as like being surrounded by a cloud of fireflies that blink in and out of existence. And so that 0.1% is in addition to the magnetic strength of the electron by the cloud of, of sort of subatomic fireflies. So when you say, oh, we measure the magnetic strength of the electron, you're measuring a combination of the, ri the, the raw magnetic strength and the cloud addition. So that's kind of the big physics background. Now we talk about the muon. Now the muon is a cousin of the electron. It's 200 times heavier. It does not live very long. It lives 2.2 microseconds. So it's very, very short at two millionths of a second. Luckily, you can use uh, Einstein's theory of relativity to boost it to high speeds, and that will uh, extend its, its length of, of being alive a little bit longer. So what's, now we're talking about muon G minus 2. So to begin with, why do we call it G minus 2? Well, it's because we're interested in the behavior of that cloud of quantum particles surrounding the, the electron or the muon. We're not really interested in what's at the center because that's kind of boring. So G minus 2 is what you measure minus the boring part. And so what you're left is simply the cool quantum stuff. So that's why it's G minus 2. 
So the muon G minus two experiment now studies not the magnetic strength of the electron, but the magnetic strength of the muon. And it is also a similar number. It is about 0.1% different from, from the 1930s prediction. So if you do that, and, and, and we've been doing this for a long time, I think the first measurement of that was back in the 1950s, but over the years we have done a better and better job. And we can now measure the magnetic strength of the muon with a precision of 12 decimal places. 12, wow. that, that's astounding. Wow. And the theoretical calculations are, are equivalent. And what we find is if you do the 2.00238, blah, 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 they agree the data or the, the measurement and the prediction agree decimal for decimal for eight digits. And they only wow. disagree in the ninth digit. So this is one part per billion where the disagreement begins. Now, to give you a sense of what one part per billion is, that is equivalent to measuring the circumference of the Earth with a precision of 30 centimeters, or a foot for my American friends. <laughs> um, and so that's how precise this wow. is. Now, once you get past that, they do disagree. Wow. And you can, um, the, the numbers I'm not going to mention now. If you're actually interested, if you look at the Fermilab YouTube channel, my last YouTube video of about a week or so ago talks about this in, in great detail. You can actually see the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, we just say that past the part per billion, they do disagree. Now, if you compare the, the measurement and the prediction, they disagree. And if you look at the uncertainties, they are like, get on the camera here, they're like this. So this might be the prediction. This might be the, the measurement, and the, the distance between my fingers is the uncertainty. And you see that the uncertainties don't agree. Now, if they were really, really close, that might be acceptable. Um, and if they overlap so that the prediction and the experiment overlap a little bit, you say they agree. Even if they were like this, they might agree. But they're, get the, here the camera. <laughs> they're like this far away. So this is not cool. They don't agree, and they don't agree within statistical uncertainty or with, with any uncertainty. And, and the disagreement is significant. It's essentially four standard deviations. So that's... Oh, wow. That is actually four standard deviations. It's pretty heavy. It is pretty heavy. Okay. But it's not, it's not the five that we do for an observation, but it's very close. So that's the state of the art in 2006. The measurement was done at Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is a sister laboratory outside New York City uh, on Long Island. And so they did an experiment, what we call the Brookhaven Muon G-2 experiment. And everything I've been telling you about is a result of their measurement. Now, obviously what you want to do is you would like to do a better measurement or, or something. But the problem is, is that the muon uh, facility was really tapped out on the amount of muons that they could produce. So it was not feasible really to, to do anything more there. So what they did is they took the muon G-2 experiment, which is a ring of magnets, and a, in, in a ring, the circumference is about 17 meters, 50 feet, and what they did is they took it, put it on a barge, brought it down the east coast of the U.S., around Florida, up the Mississippi River, all the way to near Fermilab, and then they put it on trucks, and at night, they would shut down the highways, and they would drive this experiment to Fermilab, and they dropped it off, and that was... I don't know, four or five years ago or something like that. So what we did, the, the reason we did that is we could build a new magnet at Fermi, but we saved like 20 some odd million dollars. I don't oh, remember my. the number. Saved a lot of million dollars of building this thing. <laughs> so what we did is we basically threw away all of the equipment, but we kept the magnet. Um, we refurbished everything, put new equipment in it. We measured the magnetic field of this experiment uh, to much better precision and we started it working again. Now, how did it actually work? What we would do is we would shoot muons into this magnet, and if you take a magnet, and you, uh, sorry, you, you take a, a subatomic particle like a muon, which has, it's like a bar magnet, and if you put it in a magnetic field, it will process like a top, just, just like, you know, you spin a top and you see it go around. So what we do is we measure the speed at which the precession occurs. And the speed of precession is a mix of the strength of the magnet and the strength of the magnetic field surrounding it. So we measured the magnetic field of the G-2 at Fermilab to much better precision than it was done at, Fermilab, uh, at Brookhaven. And now we're starting to get where we are. So we shoot the beam into the experiment. Now you want to make sure that you do not 
you don't you, you don't get the answer you expect. And so they even went so far as um, changing some of the parameters on the experiment and writing it down on a piece of paper, putting that piece of paper in a safe, and they did not tell the experimenters what some of the clocks were inside the experiment so that they wouldn't keep looking at the clocks and saying, oh, did we get the right result or not? So they did all their measurements. It took a couple of years. And then they went to the safe from the guy who would not tell them anything, and they punched in the numbers. And what they found was that the measurement done at Fermilab agreed with the Brookhaven measurement pretty well. There was a slight disagreement. The Fermilab measurement has slightly larger uncertainties, but the Fermilab measurement also only analyzes 6% of the data. And so we have 16 times more data we've not even looked at yet. Oh. So now if you look at the, the Fermilab measurement and the Brookhaven measurement, they're kind of like this. They don't quite overlap, but they're very close to one another. So given that they're close to one another, we can say that the two experiments, in essence, degree. And we statistically combine the two measurements. And we now have one measurement that is the combination of the Brookhaven and Fermilab measurement and the prediction. And that is where we get about the four standard deviation difference. They disagree by four standard deviations. Now, now we're getting to the real interesting thing. If an experiment and a prediction disagree by four standard deviations and the experiment is right, then the prediction is wrong. And that means that the prediction, either there's just been a mistake or the prediction does not include correct physics. There's something missing. So that's what's very exciting, and that's what you saw in the press, is everybody saying, oh, the G-2 experiment discovers new physics. It hasn't really discovered it. What it's discovered is the standard model doesn't make the correct prediction, but it hasn't actually said what it is. And so that's what you saw in the press, and that's probably what many of your, uh, your viewers and listeners know about. However, there's a however. The same day that the muon G-2 experiment result was released, which was April 7th of 2021, the same day another paper was released, which was a new theoretical calculation of the magnetic strength of the muon. Now, the original calculation was very tricky because when you have this cloud surrounding the electron, you have to include what the photons do, what the electrons do, but you also have to include what the quarks do. And quarks are... Anytime you do a calculation, of course, it's very, very difficult. So the old prediction, what it did is it looked at old data, and it took the measurements from old data and included it into the calculation. So the theoretical calculation was a combination of math and a little bit of experimental input. However, in, on April 7th, a new, measure, a new prediction was done, which is called Lattice QCD. So they, they, this is a case where it's, um, you take quantum chromodynamics, which is the theory of the strong force, you set up a three-dimensional grid, and you use petaflops of computer power. Think about that, petaflops, not gigaflops, not teraflops. Wow. Petaflops a lot of, power. of computing power to calculate what's going on between these grid points. And so they did a calculation of the, uh, the G factor for the muon. And what they found is their prediction agrees a lot more with the experiment. So if the lattice QCD measurement is true, then, or not measurement, the lattice QCD calculation is true, then maybe there's no disagreement at all. It could be that the standard model agrees very, very well with the, um, the measurement. <clears throat> however, you know, there's always a however. More, this is science. There's, 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 like, there's about more, like, however. six more however. I like it. No, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the thing is, with the lattice QCD measurement, you have to ask where their uncertainty came from. And their uncertainty came from their, the, the, the researchers' uncertainty in their method. So they, they had to do things. I mean, lattice QCD calculations are really tough. I mean, they've been around for a while. They can do things like predict the mass of, of subatomic particles with some precision. Nonetheless, they had to make some decisions. And when you make decisions, you assign an uncertainty, and their uncertainty was what a systematic uncertainty. So it may be that they made a mistake, and they acknowledge that. So now where are we are? Well, we have a prediction using data input, we have an experiment, and we have a prediction using lattice QCD. The old experimental input prediction and the data disagree. The lattice QCD agrees pretty well with the experiment, not perfectly, and kind of disagrees with the experimental prediction. But the lattice QCD measurement has concerns in how one handles it 
um, you know, did they do it right? So there are at least six other groups of, of very good physicists. Mind you, the physicists who did the last QCD uh, prediction are fantastic. They're the best. But that doesn't mean that they're right. It just means that they're very good. But there are six other groups who are similarly good, and within a year, they will be able to reproduce the lattice QCD measurement and see, or prediction rather, and see if they did it right or not. So that's number one. In addition, on a time scale of about a year, we, the G minus 2 experiment will have taken 16 times more data, 1 6, 16 times more data than they've taken so far, and they will make a better measurement. And so on a time scale of about a year or so, what we will know is if the lattice QCD prediction stands up. If it does, then maybe there is not a real, it's not as interesting as everybody thought yeah. it was. The standard model agrees with data. However, if we find that the lattice QCD prediction is somehow incorrect, then we're back to where we are, where actually the disagreement between the prediction and the theory has even grown. Now, so, that's, so we have a case of where there's no problem at all because they just did the prediction wrong in the old days, or it's right and there is a problem. Now, we get to the last question. What could it be? And that's a tougher question. And it's a tougher question because the measure, or the prediction, I'm sorry, new possible physics that could explain this, it's not completely well defined. There is the possibility that we have um, some new physics that, dis that the particles that, that generate new particles that we don't know about that interact with muons but not electrons. They are low mass particles who interact a very small amount of the time. Or, alternatively, they can be high mass particles that interact very a lot. But because they are high mass particles, even though the interaction is very high, it's hard to make high mass particles because of Heisenberg uncertainty. High mass particle is high energy. It's just difficult to do. And so you say, that, well, that's weird. How come we don't know that? Well, it's kind of like someone, um, if, if an experimentalist measured density, and you were asking, well, how big is something and how much, what's its mass? Well, if you know the density, it could be a small object with a small mass, or it could be a big object with a big mass. The density measurement doesn't actually answer your question. But what you do know is not a small object with a big mass, because that would disagree with the density. So that's where we are. We have a measurement which allows for um, either uh, small mass unknown particles that interact rarely, or large mass particles, unknown particles, that interact a lot. And so now you know everything I know about this, and what you need to really do is ask somebody in a year, what's the answer? Because so I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows the answer. Nobody. That's the deal. So, okay, that was a lot of information. But no, that, that was is... good information, though. Now we, know, <laughs> now we know the options that we have, you know? Yeah, and quick question. Why didn't they use, for example, like the tau on? Like, why isn't it the tau on G minus 2? Because, okay, so electron lives forever. The muon lives for 2.2 uh, milli, uh, microseconds, so two millionths of a second. The tau on lives for about 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So it lives a millionth as long as the tau, or the muon. So you, it would be a sensible thing. It's a fantastic idea. But you would have to somehow accelerate the particles to such energies that the Lorentz gamma would allow them to live much, much longer. And that's just not feasible. In addition, making taus is hard. Mm -hmm. So it was a balance. You could make more muons, and they live for the right amount of time. So what you said is a, a fantastic idea, but from a practical point of view, impossible. Right. Wow. Wow, so that's a lot of information from the muon experiment. I mean, truly and truly crazy. I mean, if this lattice experiment is... I mean... There's a small part of me that's kind of hoping it's wrong because, like, I would <laughs> like to see the standard model of particle physics being empty or, like, you know, requiring some extra information. I think that would be an interesting thing to know about. You know, like, I think, I think this whole, yeah, this whole thing is very exciting, very exciting time we're living in right now. So very, very excited. And for all our listeners out there, you know, if you probably did very get very excited from this conversation, you know, talking about these quantum objects, talking about muons and understanding high energies and stuff like that. So if you guys want to know more about it, go check out Brilliant. So Brilliant has some really cool courses on quantum objects. They have different courses in mechanical physics, relativistic physics, electromagnetic 
uh, electromagnetic physics, and they have different courses that are relating all to quantum mechanics. So if you guys, you know, are interested by the stuff we're talking about today with particle physics and more, obviously, go check out brilliant.org. The link is in the description below. And, Definitely. Yeah. And the first 200 listeners can actually get 20% off their premium membership. Ooh. So definitely go check that out. It's brilliant.org slash MPP. Yes, sir. And link is in the description below for those guys that are wondering. Yeah. So getting back onto the podcast, I think that was a very interesting thing, though, to understand. Because we were always, because I always thought it was something to do I did not think it was that. Okay, at least at least now I understood truly <laughs> what that experiment was. Because I saw your YouTube video. I mean, I mean, I'm subscribed to Fermilab, of course. I saw your YouTube video on Mu G minus two, and I'm like, no, I will ask him. I will <laughs> ask him. And <laughs> and I just thought that, that 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 is something that I had to do. So here we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we've spoken about your you know your experiments here. Do you wanna do you wanna talk a little bit maybe about the Higgs boson now, like talking about your LHC experience, a Large Hadron Collider experience? Because I think that's something that maybe our listeners would love to list uh, would love to hear. Because we've already spoken to a professor part of the Atlas experiment, as we were talking to you before the conversation, uh, Doctor Pekka Sinervo, part of the Atlas experiment. So maybe we can talk to you now, part of CMS, right? CMS is way cooler than Atlas. CMS, way cooler. Let's hear it. <laughs> way cooler. <laughs> let's hear it. So. Well, I, I will answer that, but let me plug of two things. Okay. One, a book not by me. It's a book by Ian Sample by the name of Massive. This is a fantastic book. It is the history of the creation and uh, search for the Higgs boson. It, you know, everybody hears about Peter Higgs, but he wasn't the only one. And this experiment talks about who talked to who back in the 1960s, and it's a fantastic book. One of the best histories of the, the Higgs. So I. Strongly recommend that. In addition, if you want to hear something about the discovery, um, I'm really fond of my book, The Large Hadron Collider, which has the experimental side. It's the I was there and what it was like and so forth. Um, so it'll it'll give you more details than than what we can talk about here. So yeah, that was that was very cool. It was a very interesting business because, you know, in the uh, I guess the the probably you know early 2000s. We didn't really have much information on what the mass of the Higgs was. Back in 1964, we had no, no, no idea at all. But over the years, we had ruled out regions of mass. And so the, by, by, you know, about when we'd started the discovery, we had ruled out a mass of a Higgs boson below 114 GeV. And a GeV is about the mass of a proton. It's not quite, but, you know, round numbers, it's about 114 times the mass of the proton. It had to be heavier than that. And we knew from theoretical concerns it had to be less than 300 times the mass of the proton. So that's kind of where we were. So there was a big rush, a, a race, to find the Higgs boson because at the time uh, the Fermilab accelerator and the CERN accelerator were both sort of operating and, and looking for things. And it's kind of weird because at the time I was both a scientist on the Fermilab accelerator and a scientist on the Large Hadron Collider. So I was competing with myself. Now, that wasn't <laughs> unique. Many of us were doing that. It was a very bizarre time. So Fermilab actually ruled out the mass of the Higgs. It couldn't be in the mass of about 160 times the mass of a proton. So we were starting to get down to, you know, the Higgs, if it existed, was probably between 114 and maybe 150 times the mass of the proton. That's where it was, if it existed. But we didn't know if it would. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had this humongous rush and... Um, it turned out that the CERN uh, collider collected enough data to make the measurement first. And so on July 4th, 2012, we announced that we found a, the, the Higgs boson, which had a mass of about 125 times the mass of a proton. So what is the Higgs boson and what is that all about? Well, that's kind of a cool thing because we talk about the standard model of particle physics, which says that there are quarks and there are leptons and there are force-carrying particles. But in the, the sort of the simple most theoretically pure version of the standard model, it predicts that all the quarks and leptons have zero mass. And we know that's not true. I mean, after all, electrons have mass, and we certainly, the top quark has a mass. All of them have mass. So what happened in 1964 was these researchers, of which Peter Higgs gets the, the you know, sort of the credit, they came up with a band-aid to the standard model called the Higgs field. And so what they did is they said, if there is a field that permeates the universe, 
um, this energy field will interact with the particles and give mass to sub the other subatomic particles. But we didn't know if it was true. And in fact, until 2012, it would have been even cooler if we had this thing at 114 GeV and at this thing at 106 or 50 or so GeV, and we slowly killed it, and then we got to the point where the Higgs boson wasn't there at all, and that would have really shaken things up. But as it happened, the prediction was correct, and we discovered <coughs> this <coughs> this subatomic particle. Now, hold on, I'm going to cough here for a second. Sure. <laughs> <coughs> Too much talking. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, um, anyways, the... Um, the thing that gives mass to subatomic particles is not the Higgs boson, but the Higgs field. And that is this energy field that's everywhere. It's very much like Star Wars, you know, <laughs> force <laughs> permeates and surround us and all that. Um, but that field can vibrate. And so the Higgs boson is vibrations of that field. So what we discovered was the vibrations of the Higgs field. And that, that's what we, we did. And it was truly amazing. Um, and in 2013, just... Uh, 15 months or so after the discovery, Peter Higgs and Francois Anglaire shared the Nobel Prize for the discovery, not for the discovery, but for their prediction mm -hmm. of the Higgs In like 1960-something, right? Peter Higgs and uh, Francois 1964. 1964. That was, man, take that like, like 40, 50 years just to find this thing. And do you want to talk a little, yeah, do you want to maybe discuss a little more about how you actually discovered the Higgs? Like, was there, because I know that famous, that famous picture of the Large Hadron Collider, but like, I know, obviously, I can't really interpret that. So is there, like, what, was there something specific that you did? Did you see the data and interpret something? Or did you straight up just detect, like, did one of your detectors go off and that's the Higgs <laughs> detector or something like that? Like, no, what? man, finding yeah. the Higgs is a real nightmare. Yeah, it must real. have been, I mean, right? <laughs> it's an insane nightmare. Must have been. So what happens is... Um, we collide two protons together at near the speed of light. So E equals mc squared is a thing. And so all of that energy of those moving particles at near the speed of light collided and converted into a massive particle. And that does it all the time. That's how we found the top quark, how we found lots of things. But we also, one of the things it did is make Higgs bosons. Now Higgs bosons decay in many different ways. They can decay, and in, in the most likely way it decays, it, well, back up. Because the Higgs field is the generates mass, things that have high mass interact more with the Higgs field. And people get this wrong. They say that high mass objects um, interact with the Higgs, but it's because the Higgs gives them mass that they interact with them. So at the mass scale of the Higgs boson, what it most likely does is it decays into the heaviest particles allowed by energy conservation, and that's two bottom quarks. So what you do is you're smashing these protons together, looking for bottom quarks to come flying out. Well, it turns out making bottom quarks is easy because you can smash them together, and through the strong nuclear force, which is to say they're gluons, the gluons make bottom quark pairs, bottom quark pairs are flying out all the time. So what you have to do is not just find the bottom quark pairs, because you see them all the time, but you have to find which ones are from Higgs. And that's actually exceedingly difficult because they're buried. It's like trying to find a diamond in a barrel full of cubic zirconia. It's just, it, it's in there somewhere, but finding it is ridiculous. Now, what happens extremely rarely is a proton and a proton hits together, makes a um, Higgs boson. The Higgs boson decays into top quarks in this weird quantum thing. And the top quarks actually make two photons. So now you have the protons coming together and two photons coming out. Now, two photons coming out also happens all the time, but we can measure photons incredibly well. And so what you do is you look for pairs of photons and you use Einstein's equation, not just E equals mc squared, but his full correct equation, which also includes momentum. So, the, you know, it may surprise many of your listeners or viewers, but E equals mc squared is wrong. Mm -hmm. and by wrong, I mean incomplete. We've spoken about this, yeah, yeah. Continue. It's only true if the momentum is zero. The correct equation is E squared equals mc squared, all squared, plus the momentum squared times the speed of light squared. So you can do some arithmetic, and if we just subtract, we set the speed of light equal to one, which 
physicists do because it's easy. So you then have e squared equals m squared plus p squared. You put you subtract the p squared off to one side and you have m squared equals e squared minus p squared. So that's kind of neat. So if you could measure the energy and the momentum of the Higgs boson, you'd know its mass. Unfortunately, the Higgs boson lives for about 10 to the minus 24 seconds. It doesn't even hit our detector. But its daughter particles do, those two photons do. And so now you can use the, the physics that you learn in your introductory physics class, either in high school or your first year at university, where energy is conserved. So the energy of the two photons added together equals the energy of the Higgs. And the momentum of the two photons equals the momentum of the Higgs. So what you're doing, this is insanely cool, I, I just love this. You measure um, the, the energy and momentum of the daughter particles. You use the physics of high school. And from that, you can actually determine the mass of the particle that made these two photons. So now what you do is you just do that for every photon, two pairs of photons you find. And you um, make a mass distribution. You plot, you know... On the horizontal axis, you have how many are the mass, and on the vertical axis, you have how many of each ones you find. And what you find is it drops off, and there's a little bump, and it's a tiny, tiny bump. Um, but that little itty bitty tiny bump, that little excess, is the Higgs boson. Because then what you do is you go to your theory, and you make a prediction, and you find that smooth curve, but there's no bump in that smooth curve. And so you, sub you take the prediction, you subtract it off from your measurement, and you're left with a bump. And now you search in on the bump, and now you're starting to get the parameters for the Higgs boson. So the first thing we discovered or uh, measured was this mass. But then um, you start looking at the direction that the photons come out, and you try to measure its spin. Because a prediction of Higgs theory is that the Higgs boson has zero spin. However, um, if you had, for instance, a, a particle that has spin equals two, you know, that's the graviton. So, you know, you could have found a you know, graviton going to two photons or something like that. But we determined that the particle that we were seeing had a certain mass, had no charge because two photons has no electric charge, and it had a spin of zero. So it's looking more and more like it is the Higgs boson. So that's how you do it. You never, no one has ever actually seen the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson has never hit our detector. What we see are the daughters. So and we, we use our logic to Higgs go backward. Boson. Yes, that's exactly how it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, and that. I had a quick question, or maybe it's not that quick, but <laughs> um, like, moving back to, because you mentioned the top quark a few times now. And so um, going back to that time where you were discovering the top quark, what was the situation like in terms of the standard model? Like, what kind of quarks did we know and like versus what we know now? And how did the top quark even come about? Like, did you did you know that there was something that was missing and you went looking for it? Or did it just come out of nowhere? Yeah. Good question. Um, again, I'm not going to plug a different book because there's, a book, there's actually two books I really like. Um, one is called The Second Creation by um, Robert Kreese. And it's a good store, uh, history of particle physics in general. And the other one, which I like maybe even better, is my own book, Understanding the Universe. And it has the answer to that. But so, so if someone wants to spend some time reading that, they, they should. So let's get back to answering your question. It's a, a fantastic question. So the standard model contains quarks and leptons. Inside protons and neutrons are two types of quarks called up and down. Stupid name. All the quarks have stupid name. They're up, down, <laughs> charm, strange, top and bottom. Particle physics are silly about this sort of thing. Um, so what we had discovered, um, well, in 1964 was when quarks were proposed. And what was proposed was the up, down, and strange quark. No other quarks were known. On the lepton side, we knew about the electron, we knew about the muon, and we knew that there was an electron and a muon neutrino. So we don't have, we didn't know... Um, about the top quark, the bottom quark, the charm quark, nor did we know about the tau or the tau neutrino. So that's where we stood when the standard model began. That's when the Higgs boson was, or the Higgs field was predicted. Now in 1974, oh, back up. The up and down quark um, have two different charges. If in a, in a, in a coordinate, not a coordinate system, but in a, in a system where the proton has a charge of plus one, and the electron has a charge of minus one, 
The up quark has a charge of two thirds, the down quark has a china charge of minus one third, and the strange quark has a charge of minus one third. So if you look at that, you say, well, gee, why, is there, why are there two minus one thirds and only one two thirds? Well, it's possible that there was another um, quark that had two thirds, but nobody knew if that were true. So in 1974, the charm quark was discovered and everybody went, ah, that's great. Because now you had two ups, or you know, two two-third quarks, two uh, minus one-third quarks, you had two neutrinos, you had two electrons, life is good. And then, in 1977, a guy by the name of Leon Letterman and his colleagues, um, Jack Steinberger and Mel Schwartz, no, back up, Leon Letterman did it. He did, he got his Nobel Prize with those guys, but for something else. So they discovered another minus one third quark. They found a bottom quark. So we had not found, uh, oh, actually, by that time, we had found the tau lepton too. So sorry, sorry, but now, when you say discovered, sorry to cut you off, sorry to cut you off, but when you say discovered the quark, again, are you talking about, because particle accelerators weren't a thing. So when you of say course they, they were. But oh, they were. Particle accelerators have been a thing since 1930. <laughs> so, so when you say discovered, they legitimately saw a new particle. Yeah, they smashed oh. the beam into you know proton okay. beam into a target, and okay. by God, okay. sorry, yeah, continue, continue. That's a bottom quark, by God. Interesting. Well, okay. So they they discovered the bottom quark. In fact, they discovered a particle called the upsilon, which is you know because <laughs> we use Greek letters a lot, which was a bound state of a bottom and an antimatter bottom quark. And so that was discovered. So. Now, say the year is 1990, what did we know? We knew about the up-down charm strange quarks, we knew about the bottom quark, but there wasn't that two-thirds version. So we went looking, and we went looking and looking. Now, mind you, the bottom quark was discovered in 1977. The top quark was discovered in 1995, so there was 20 years of people looking and trying to find it. So when we were looking for the top quark, we had a pretty good idea that it probably existed. We had a pretty good idea of its properties. We didn't know its mass, and, but there were a lot of theoretical calculations that said, if its mass is this, you will see these decay properties. If its mass is that, you will see these decay properties. And so we took that theoretical guidance and started searching. And it was in 1995 that we discovered the particle with a mass of 172 billion electron volts, and that is a mass of 183 times the mass of a proton. That's like a molybdenum atom or something like that, all in a space with no charge or no size whatsoever. Oh, wow. So that's how we did it, that we had theoretical guidance telling us not exactly where to look, but it gave us a plan. You know, in, in a certain energy range, you did one thing, in another energy range, you did another thing. And eventually we found it, but it, it took 20 years. Wow. wow, that top quark really gave you problems. <laughs> and well, the you know, quark, the Higgs right? boson took 50 years, so, you know, oh, yeah, top well, quark that, was easy peasy. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely another anomaly. But yeah, so the, for our listeners, also the top quark is the heaviest quark, right, that we have. Exactly. And is there any significance of that? Like, is there, because I've always wondered, again, with these weird names and everything, there might be some significance to the charm and strange or whatever. Like, is there any significance to their names and the reasons they have mass, this, this amount of mass? Sort of, sort okay. of. So um, up and down have a name. And this, so this is for anyone who's done a little bit of nuclear physics. There's isospin. So isospin is something that if you haven't learned about, you will if you're a physics major. And inside a proton, you can treat the proton, as far as the nuclear force is concerned, you can treat the proton and the neutron as being identical, even though one has a charge and one doesn't. But they, and the way you separate them is this thing called isospin. One has got a plus a half isospin, and one has got a minus a half isospin. So it's the same mathematics as ordinary spin. It's a theoretical construct called isospin. And so um, since one has... Um, the, the plus a half is spin up, and the minus a half is spin down. And so since the, um, the, uh, the proton has two ups and a down, it has more up isospin. So that's why the quark name became up and down. Strange was back in, I don't know, I guess strange was probably discovered in the 1940s or so because in particle accelerators existed then. And so what they found, they found this really weird 
kind of particles. They were easy to make, but hard to decay. And usually the, the rule is live by the sword, die by the sword. If you live, if you're easy to make, you're easy to decay. But these were strange because they were easy to make and hard to decay. And it turned out that they were hard to decay because they had a strange quark in them. So that's the history of the up, down, and strange names. Those have real historical okay, answers. So that makes sense. Okay, so there's some sense to those names. Okay, continue. Yeah, so Let's now the rest is less so. So now, <laughs> okay. you're, now you're getting into sort of physics apocrypha. Because I've, I've heard this story. I don't know if it's true. Someone said, wouldn't it be charming if there was a, <laughs> a, you know, another one that was equivalent to the up quark and the charm quark was discovered? And as far as the top and bottom quark, I'm actually not sure where that came from. In fact, for quite a while, it was truth and beauty. So there were these two groups that were arguing. This is the truth and the beauty quark and the top and the bottom quark. And, you know, so searching for beauty or searching, you know, with people who are looking for the top quark, they could write fancy papers. Physicists search for truth, which was very poetic. But for some reason that I, I really actually don't know, the t uh, truth and beauty names just sort of fell out of favor, and we call them top and bottom quark. It has no meaning whatsoever, really. So Now, you might ask, and it would be a perfectly reasonable question to ask yourself, is there a fourth one? I mean, we have these three identical columns. Okay. Could there be a fourth? And the answer is yes, there could be, but, 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 but. We did a measurement. So we haven't talked about forces. There are four of the known forces. There's the... Um, uh, electromagnetism, there is gravity, and there's the strong and weak nuclear force. And though each of those forces comes with a particle. So the weak nuclear force, one of the particles is a thing called a Z boson. So that's a lot of dump on people, but just trust me, the Z boson is a weak force particle. And so there was an experiment at the CERN laboratory called LEP for the Large Electron-Positron Collider. So they collided electron and antimatter electrons, and they made Z bosons. And they made a gajillion Z bosons, millions of G bosons, and they studied them. And so um, because of, of quantum mechanics, you know, th this particle has a certain mass, but it also has a width, meaning that even though the mass of the Z boson is 90 GeV, um, it's not always 90. Some are like 89 and some are 91. And so you can make a measurement of that and you make a, a bell curve. And you find out, as I think the, the width, the, the standard deviation of that is like 2.3 GeV. So it's 90.1 GeV plus or minus 2.3. Well, if you make that curve and you do it properly, um, the width of that curve depends on how many neutrinos it can decay into. And so... If you do that measurement, and this was the first measurement they made, what they found out was that the Z boson can decay into three neutrinos. Not, and, and actually the experimental measurement was something, I think, I think it was like 2.95 plus or minus 0.05. And so since the number of neutrinos is an integer, with that kind of uncertainty, my God, that's three. Yeah. So now that's a long story. So that says that there are three neutrinos into which a Z boson can decay. So since those columns come with a plus two-thirds, a minus one-third, a, a quarks, a charged lepton, and a neutrino, and there are three columns, if the Z boson can only decay into three neutrinos, then maybe there are only three columns. So you would say, aha, we have proof that there's only three columns. But, and of course, but, there's always a but. Um, maybe that fourth neutrino is heavy, heavier than the other ones. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there's a much heavier neutrino too heavy for the Z boson to decay into. And then in which case, there could be more quarks. So, I don't know. I don't know. But, <laughs> wow. it, it, but the evidence is suggestive that there are three. You know what's amazing though? You, you know what's amazing? The fact that at your level, you can say, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like that is the beauty of science that no one knows. We're all figuring it out. Like I just loved it how you just said, I don't know. Like that's the thing. Some, you just don't know. Like, that's science, finding it out. And that's really, really important because p <laughs> part of the problem with kids learning science is they are learning things that have been discovered. If I know the answer to it, I'm not interested. I'm not interested, you know? exactly. I got people for that. They, 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 exactly. they handle that. I want to be confused. I want to not know the answer. I'm an explorer. People who are scientists are explorers. They are literally stepping forward into the unknown, going to places where no one has thought before. And if people start thinking of scientists 
in that way rather than, oh, here's a bunch of stuffy facts. That's not what scientists do. That's for historians. Scientists, if they're not confused, they're not, you know, they're not happy. Wow. That's, wow, right. that's, yeah, that's. I mean, the what do you do if you, know, we've heard. Yep. if you know everything, what do you do? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would be boring. I, I, yeah. we, we were talking about this when I, where I saw this one show where this kid was uh, he had the he had an, uh, he had the option to know everything in the universe. And he was a science kid. And um, in his mind, like all these scientists were saying, well, what's the point of that? Why, why would I want to know everything? Because he, he was asking, like, you know, his... Uh, anyway, this is just a show. It's a weird show. The, the, again, the essence very similar to the point you were making, right? There's no point in knowing everything. The entire purpose of science is finding out, is searching for it. And that's Although, the you know, if someone gave me that pill, if I could know everything, I'd probably take you it because so? I would spend a lifetime trying to understand it all and learning and figure out how it is. But isn't that, isn't that the fun? Isn't that why we do science though? Because we want to know why these things make sense. Cause if we already knew it, then, well, as you said, what's the point? Well, but I'd want to succeed. You know, I, I'm, I'm not doing this not to succeed. You know, if I had some theory of everything idea there, I went, Oh my God, if you just had these snorf bark particles that I just invented, <laughs> it all makes sense. Yeah. Okay, that's actually a little different. I think I think that that's not really the purpose. I think that the, the, the main purpose was, well, would you want to know everything in the universe? Would you want to know the answer to everything? And that that was the typical thing that I would I would kind of think twice about that because I don't know if I would because why would you? Because I, I don't know. I think I, I think the essence of, of science is the learning aspect of it. And, you know, learning about more and more and the unknown and moving into the unknown. And obviously we're just starting our careers right now. So who knows where it's going to take us, but that's the beauty of it, right? Who knows where it's going to take us? That's the beauty. Yeah, but remember, there are, sci there are questions beyond science. I mean, you know, I could ask, you know, other interesting questions too. Um, so I personally am driven by curiosity. And it's true. I think if I knew all the answers to, to science, then I would stop being a scientist and I would be right. whatever the unknown is because I am driven by that. Exactly. But yeah, I, I'm, I would be cool if someone, you know, dropped this bomb on me and you know, said, gee, here's a lot of answers. Yeah, I want to <laughs> know the answers. I mean, I do want to know, you know, but, I, but then I'd get bored with it. That's true. I would yeah, get right. bored with it and right. I'd find some other thing to check out. Exactly. Well, maybe I'd learn to juggle or something. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you know, taking that pill and then suddenly, you know, you, 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 you can understand it in your head, but the problem might be that we don't have a way to describe what you understand, like mathematically. And so the issue would be now to like translate what you know with like unknown math that we just don't have yet. And then you might just be stuck like, I know it, but you know, like, I can't really tell you, but I know it. <laughs> that's a way. Yeah, I guess that's also a possibility. So then, you know, I'd find some smart mathematician. You guys are physics and math after all. We'd sit down and I'd say, you know, this is about how it is. And what I find with mathematicians is they say, ah, yeah, because they got all kinds of crazy ideas, you know. And probably what they'd say is some, some you know, um, 1800s mathematician already solved that. And it's this. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the classic mathematician answer. <laughs> but I, I, I was just thinking as we were talking about this, are we discovering more math? Because like with physics, we have, you know, like there's always new physics. There's like, we literally know like 3% of the universe, right? That's the whole thing. But in math, like, I don't know. Are we discovering or adding more math? Sure. Like we Look are. at any math journal. I guess, I guess I don't really subscribe to much ma like pure math. I'm, I'm mainly in the mathematical physics section. I think Barker is too. So we don't, we don't really subscribe to direct math. So I think that's why I never really thought about this question. But so math is still evolving, so. Oh, absolutely. All the time. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, by God, they think of crazy stuff, man. Mathematicians. <laughs> yeah. Way harder yeah. than what I do. I have a math I mean, degree, and I went, man, these guys are nuts. I got to do physics. It's easier. Yeah, but that's so abstract. You know, like we've spoken about this before. It's such an abstract concept. With physics, you can, you know, you as you said, like you can you perform experiments. You can determine things. You can determine predictions. Might not be today like Peter Higgs friend, so I had to wait 50 years. So it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but it might happen one day. I, Albert Einstein never even saw his, his own black hole discovery. So, you know, it might not happen in your own lifetime, but the fact that it might is, is the whole, is the whole yeah. essence of the whole. The thing about reason. like abstract math though, is that yeah. 
like usually it's the case that something is is theorized there's there's a new theorem that's published and then a long while later it's like oh this is connected to this physical occurrence so yeah but yeah, I mean, a lot of Galois' work back in the, what, 1800s or so then became incredibly useful when we started doing things in the 1900s, ring theory and group theory. I mean, mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> the the, the um, theorist who invented um, quarks invented group theory only to find out that it had been done over 100 years ago by a mathematician. You know, so there's That's a lot of so that. Sad. So you're exactly right. <laughs> what you said is exactly right. Parker. That's so sad. <laughs> a physicist figuring out that a mathematician solved it before him. That's that must be a blow. That must. Be uh, well, I mean, he still tied it to the physical true, world. True, he got his yeah. Nobel Prize. You well, know, yeah, that's all but, he but the mathematics was the the mathematicians kind of went. Oh, yeah, just yeah. Look yeah. At this in the undergraduate textbook here. <laughs> We're already <laughs> on to the next thing. It's uh, you guys will catch up later. You know. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, yeah so I think, I think uh, we basically asked a lot of our questions today. I think we've understood. We know a lot more about you, Don, today. Thank you for this, for sitting down with us. Amazing conversation. Had to have you. Hopefully we can do this again. We can maybe do this sometime. We have, you know, different questions on specifically like your books and talking about, you know, black holes and your theories on extra dimensions and stuff that maybe we can get into in a future episode with you that would be really cool so i just want perhaps i just want to definitely thank you for coming on this podcast and thank you for taking your time out of your day to you know sit down with us have this conversation happy thank to you. do it it's always fun to talk to you and of course your listeners because they're curious people and exactly. the point definitely. is thank we you. need to let people know about how this amazing stuff is because sure. why should we have all the fun why should we <laughs> exactly exactly, exactly. so good, yeah buddy. For everybody that's listening to this podcast right now, make sure to follow us, leave any questions in the comments section below, and uh, you can find all of our updates and things like that in our clips on our Instagram at math.physics.podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that's everything, right? That is everything. I don't think we have anything to add. Are we missing anything? Right. I think we're good. No. Awesome. Good. Thank you so, so much for listening. And once again, yeah. Don, thank you so much for coming on. No, oh, thanks for asking me. Okay. Yeah, so this has been episode number 64 of the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we will see you soon. Bye, guys. See ya.